On the 4th of July this year, a spate of shark attacks across Florida and particularly Texas rocked America. An otherwise fun day out at the beach on Independence Day manifested into a literal living nightmare for a number of families, with two people left with potentially life-changing injuries. Four swimmers on South Padre Island in Texas had run-ins with a shark that day, and many reports suggested it was the same individual responsible that had moved up the coastline. This spate of incidents was even more unusual considering the area had only seen a total of seven unprovoked shark attacks in the last 70 years, and suddenly they'd had more than half that total in the space of a few hours. In the days after the event, shark attack specialists scratched their heads trying to figure out how something like this could have happened, some of whom even pointed to an impending hurricane as a potential factor. And today we're going to investigate just that by figuring out whether hurricanes really do increase your risk of a shark attack, and whether that was the confounding factor that led to this series of incidents. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. I know there's a bunch of you out there that wanted to hear my thoughts on the tech Texas 4th of July shark attacks when it actually happened. Normally I tend to hold back a little bit on the shark attack videos unless I feel like I have something valuable to say about the incident. But the stuff linking Hurricane Beryl to the 4th of July attacks I found particularly interesting and as we'll learn a little bit later on, perhaps not as conclusive as some might say. Right up first then we're going to have a look at some of the incidents themselves and then a bit later on we'll take a scientific deep dive into hurricanes and how certain sharks behave around them. So at around 11am on the 4th of July 2024, a man was swimming in about waist-deep water with his family off 4100 Gulf Boulevard on South Padre Island when he was pulled underwater by a shark. The man's father-in-law describes how he just disappeared under the water before he surfaced shouting that there was a shark. After dragging him to shore, it was revealed that the shark had taken a chunk out of his leg and emergency workers collected him from the scene and rushed him to hospital. As those emergency workers were responding to that incident, a second 911 call came in reporting of another incident about half a mile up the beach. Victoria Ramos, again in waist-deep water, describes the feeling of being punched in the calf and as she turned around she spotted a shark thrashing in the water beside her. She and her friends ran from the water and Ramos only ended up with superficial wounds on her calf. Whether those were from the teeth of the shark or just grazes from the rough skin, we don't know. Although emergency workers ended up treating her at the scene and she didn't need to go to hospital. A few hours later, further up the beach on South Padre Island, more 911 calls would be made as more shark attacks were reported. And this time, the aftermath of those attacks were caught on film. Texas resident Tabitha Sullivan was out swimming in shallow water with her daughter when she spotted a dark shadow next to her in the water. Thinking it was a big fish, she tried to kick it away, which was when it clamped down on her left calf. The shark ended up biting through the back of her calf completely shredding the majority of the muscle away. Tabitha's husband, Carey, then rushed into the water to help her, which you can see in this clip here, although as he was carrying her back to shore, the shark continued its pursuit of Tabitha. In the footage here slowed down, you can see Carey having to drop Tabitha and just jump on top of the shark, punching it and wrestling it, while also grabbing its tail to try and fend it off. Eventually, the shark loses interest as other onlookers rushed into the water to help drag Tabitha out. They ended up pulling her to shore where members of the public made a makeshift tourniquet out of a belt and called the emergency services. This footage here is particularly grim, so it's been blurred out, but there really isn't much left of her calf muscle after the bite, and you can see just how much blood she's lost in that water there as the shark continued to swim in the shallows about 20 yards offshore. Tabitha was rushed to hospital for life-saving surgery with her husband, Carey, sustaining minor injuries to his thigh while he fought off that shark. After receiving more reports that the shark was still hanging around the sandbar, officials headed out on boats and sent up a helicopter to try and get eyes on the shark. And the helicopter managed to get this footage here of a shark swimming around the area where the second attacks had taken place. And this is a great clip to help us ID this particular animal. There was a few people online having seen the footage of the shark fins in the water saying that this was a tiger shark. But looking at this helicopter footage, it's 100% a bull shark. You've got the super characteristic broad shaped head there, the chunky dorsal fin, but the big telltale sign here is that notch in the upper lobe of the caudal fin there. This is also called the subterminal notch and in bull sharks, these are really quite pronounced. They're at least a lot more pronounced in bull sharks than they are in tiger sharks. So yeah, this is absolutely a bull shark. It's also our first bit of insight here into what the sea conditions were like on that day. From the other clips, we can see there's a few waves and it looks a bit choppy from the wind, but from this aerial footage, you can just see how churned up and murky that water is. It's almost brown. So not long after this footage was taken, a nearby boat that was also following the shark managed to corral it out to deeper water where it wasn't seen again. So we've got four people there involved with the bull shark over two separate incidents. I remember at the time reading about this as it was coming out and it was sort of presented as if they were four entirely separate incidents happening in different places on South Padre. 
Boundary Island. As in, the shark bit someone, moved further up the beach, bit another person, moved further up the beach, bit another person, so on and so forth. But in reality, we've got two people who were undoubtedly seriously injured, and then another two people who had slightly more superficial injuries. That's not to lessen the awful experience these people went through, by the way. I imagine it's been very, very traumatizing for all of them. But I remember at the time thinking it was being presented slightly differently. So not long after these attacks, officials came out to release some of the details that we know now, and a few shark scientists also weighed in to give their opinions. It was widely reported that the same individual shark was responsible for injuring all four people on that day on South Padre Island. And based on the timings and the locations, I'd say that probably checks out, although we can't say that with 100% certainty. It would still be exceptionally rare for the same shark to bite several people in relative quick succession, but not impossible. I think as well, based on the eyewitness reports for the size of the shark across all of the incidents, the same sort of size was being reported, somewhere between six to eight feet long. As more time passed though, there was the suggestion that these attacks could have been as a result of the impending Hurricane Beryl. I know that an official from Texas Parks and Wildlife called Captain Dowdy mentioned the hurricane theory, and shark researcher Dr. Kesley Banks, working out of Texas A&M University, mentioned it as well. Now, the science behind sharks and hurricanes stems from a pretty cool research paper written by Lee Gatowski back in 2021. It turns out sharks might be able to detect barometric pressure changes, which is the measure of air pressure in the atmosphere. And when a large tropical storm or even a hurricane is brewing, normally there's a steep decline in barometric pressure. The lower that barometric pressure drops, the stronger the storm. So if a shark can detect changes in barometric pressure, that gives it some clues as to when that storm's about to hit. And different shark species respond to a storm in different ways. Some shark species will choose to leave an area before a storm arrives and head off out to deeper water, whereas other shark species will choose to stay closer to shore before, during, and after that storm. In the Gatowski study, they found that tiger sharks decided to stay in a particular area of the Bahamas, which was directly hit by Cat 4 Hurricane Matthew in 2016. The sightings of tiger sharks actually ended up doubling after the hurricane hit because it's thought the sharks were looking to scavenge on any animals that had been killed in the storm. In the very same study, though, they also looked at what bull sharks did before and after Cat 3 Hurricane Irma hit Miami in 2017. Unlike the tiger sharks, the bull sharks were nowhere to be seen before and during the storm, suggesting that they'd actually headed off out to deeper water for safety. And I thought that was pretty strange, considering this was being used as a reason as to why these attacks happened on the 4th of July. Because the scientific literature wasn't quite backing this up, at least not the Gatowski study anyway. So I went and did some more digging and found a different study that had been done over a longer period of time and had a few more data points to work with. This research paper here was written by Delaney Reynolds under the supervision of Dr. Neil Hammerschlag, a pretty renowned shark scientist. And it showed that bull sharks had higher residency time inside Biscayne Bay during extreme category five hurricanes and interestingly, during less severe tropical storms. In other words, bull sharks during Cat 5 hurricanes or tropical storms decided to stay within the confines of the bay to shelter from that storm. So you can see, at least for bull sharks anyway, our understanding of how they behave around hurricanes and tropical storms is a little bit sketchy, and the results have varied quite a bit across the sides of the literature. Some bull sharks might detect that drop in barometric pressure and head off out to deeper water for safety, whereas some of them might head into bays to shelter from the storm. So could this particular bull shark on the 4th of July have been coming to South Padre Island for refuge from that hurricane. Well, based on the geography of South Padre, we can see that it's a barrier island that stretches about 34 miles long. The east side looks out into the Gulf of Mexico and the west side backs out into Laguna Madre, a hypersaline estuary with salt levels higher than that of the sea. Now, because it's hypersaline, it's not the best habitat for bull sharks. They are found in Laguna Madre from time to time, but only occasionally, and definitely not the adults. When the water is that salty, it's actually quite costly from an Osmo regulation perspective to spend time in there. So the big ones will tend to steer clear of Laguna Madre. So it's unlikely this bull shark was coming to shelter from the hurricane because its place of shelter isn't actually the best environment for it to be hanging around in for any extended period of time. It's just too salty. It got me thinking more and more though that maybe Hurricane Beryl wasn't actually a legitimate reason for these attacks happening, at least not one that had much scientific backing anyway. The data that's out there on this in the scientific literature, in my opinion anyway, doesn't really support it. There's too many varying results. So if I don't think it was the hurricane, what do I think it was? Well, two of which that we've already touched on a little bit is the species of shark and the conditions on that day. Bull sharks are of course one of the more aggressive shark species out there and are well known for their incidents with humans. Alongside this, during the summer months in the Gulf of Mexico, these sharks will be mating with each other very close to the coasts. And the females that were pregnant from the year before are coming 
into the bays and estuary mouths to give birth to their young. So you've got pumped up male bull sharks full of testosterone who are looking to mate. And then you've got female bull sharks who've just expended a load of energy giving birth who need to replenish those energy stocks. And both of them are coming incredibly close to the shore. They're moving through water that we can see from the videos is ridiculously murky and cloudy. Visibility is probably no more than a couple of feet here. And then what do we throw into the mix? Oh yeah, the 4th of July. Millions of people would have flocked to beaches across America. And considering the decent weather, the South Texas beaches would have been no different. On that particular day, the 34 mile stretch of coastline that makes up up South Padre Island would have been teeming with tens of thousands of people, all enjoying themselves in the sun, a scorching 91 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the perfect day to head out into the sea to cool down. But as we can see from this graph, that was a sea that had been churned up by decent wind speeds and made that water wavy and murky, lowering visibility considerably. And when you've got thousands of people in really murky water with either a pumped up male bull shark or an energy deficient female bull shark, your chances of having a negative of interaction goes up. Those factors right there are undoubtedly all merging together to create conditions where you can end up with a shark attack, or in this case, multiple shark attacks. Now, I'm not saying that the impending hurricane didn't contribute to this happening and that that hypothesis is a load of rubbish. I'm just saying I think there are clearer reasons when you look at some of these other factors. The hurricane stuff for me is just a bit more wishy-washy in this context. If we'd have been talking about a tiger shark being responsible for the 4th of July attacks, you could look at that data in the scientific literature and go, yeah, hurricane probably checks out here. But we weren't talking about a tiger shark. It was a bull shark, a large predatory shark species that is well known for biting humans in murky slash brackish water. It's probably still fairly sound advice though for anyone out there thinking of going for a swim before, during or after a hurricane that's not the safest thing to do. For a whole host of reasons, drowning or being swept out to sea being two of the most obvious ones, but increasing your chances of encountering a scavenging tiger shark is clearly one as well. So while natural phenomena like hurricanes might increase the risk of a shark attack, I'm not convinced it was the biggest factor in play for the 4th of July incidents. Speaking of natural phenomena and shark attacks though, have you ever heard that the moon could be playing a role? Well, in this video right here, I taught you through all the strange things that happen to sharks when the full moon rises, and we get to the bottom of whether it really causes a spike in shark attacks. So give it a watch here. 